Um, is, was it a, is it a restatement? What's the actual revenues and actual expenditures? It wasn't there last year, but or in an audited statement, it's not there, but it is now. Why? What happens at the end of the year is when we close the books officially, the, those revenues and expenditures close to the essentially unrestricted fund balance. So yeah, we haven't closed the books yet on June, so that's why those revenues and expenditures are still showing. So the net of that's really the, the, the surplus that was generated. Right, but so technically yeah. you could take the difference between your revenues and expenditures. Yeah, revenues right. are higher and just right. add it to the yeah. unrestricted. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have questions on the balance sheet? Just, just a quick question on, and I, the accrued payroll is quite a bit different from what is there? Is there a reason that there's? I would right. think payroll would be pretty consistent, but it was actually lower this year and prior to prior year end. Is that vacations or something else? That it's um, it could be that it's a work in process. We're still, like I said, these numbers are going to be changing. I mean, if I give this report to you next month, these numbers will be different. And so there's nothing structural in there. It's that's not possible. structural at this okay. stage. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think I'm not sure if the school's posted theirs, but I know the town is still in the process of posting ours. Okay. So. Any, anything else, Chris? No. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the uh, spend side. So this is a comparative between last year, which is audited, and this year, which is, is unaudited. Um, I kind of focused on the accounts departments that were um, above the 100% spent under um, administration. Exec executive, I think we Executive, call it. sorry. Executive. Yeah. The, there's about five different items that play into that. The first is um, the general government office equipment. That's where all of our lease, uh, lease payments go, supplies for the copiers around the town are charged, and we've been habitually under budgeted in that line, and we have started trying to increase those budgets a little bit at a time, so uh, that's that's about 14,000, 12,000, excuse me. Yeah, we found we won't really think it's beneficial to consolidate those costs. Colette handles all of that now, so we have a better control uh, of all of those costs. Frankly, it's a reconciliation. We need to budget it properly, and uh, I think we'll make that correction at the next budget time. Or over a, maybe a two or three. So yeah, it's not a, go ahead. Okay. So um, what will a purchasing manager do in terms of negotiating of the lease contracts? Are they going to be involved in that as well, or is that going certainly. to be? Okay. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. And really the point person when supplies need to be ordered, but yeah. uh, procurement officer will will uh, help provide all the pricing um, up until that point. Okay. Uh, but we just find it so much better to control things out of one office rather than having half a dozen do all their different ordering. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if, the, if the overfunding is something that may even be realized in efficiency it may. down the road. It may. Uh, better pricing will certainly close that gap. Let's, let's hope that's part of it. Okay. Um, additionally, there was uh, about a $1,400 over expenditure under contingency, which I believe was a council retreat. Yeah, it's the Delphi <laughs> group. Uh, <laughs> uh, we also had uh, some over expenditures under workers' compensation and... Um, Insurance, we have to pay our deductible, and then sometimes we pay for uh, work that is done on whatever workers' comp or liability claims. I think we had for a uh, higher number of incidents. small incidents, but there's a deductible that is associated with each one, so I think that accounts for that account being that over. Interestingly, uh, we are chronically over in legal. This year we weren't, which we see as a good mm -hmm. trend. That's usually the, the the single item in that executive category that's out of whack, and mm. we seem to have pulled that back into into shape. Is that a result of sorry? No, go. Uh, is that a result of, uh, of diminished litigation, or is that a result of um, you know, we just had a new contract that we, we brought up with the, uh, or we reviewed the contract with the legal services. Yeah, pricing isn't any better as a result of that. I think our relations are improved in terms of streamlined, uh, but I think you're exactly right. Uh, we've worked through those expensive litigations. We're sitting and waiting for appeals, mm -hmm. for, uh, for the law court to decide some of these matters, but we ran up some big costs there. I think also uh, 
there's been some change in personnel. Other past uh, employees were quick to call the town attorney, uh, not inappropriately, don't mind you. But mm -hmm. um, I think all of that comes, um, you know, counts into this for sure. Okay. Litigation of all of the different legal accounts. Litigation is still uh, overspent, but the other ones are underspent. So that right now where we mm -hmm. are. Yep. Uh, the last one that would have that has affected the executive are the benefit lines uh, with the union contracts, and uh, we pay out vacation and sick. We've had uh, some folks who have retired more so than in the past, so I think that's affected us as well. Yeah, we had five long-term employees, like 30-plus year employees, retire this year, so that payout is understandably higher than normal. Is, is there a, a point at which they have to declare they're going to retire? I mean, like on this, I know on the school side they have to give a certain notice. I mean, nothing's obviously set in stone, but it's a, a courtesy if you were to give notice by a certain time, so that can be built into the budget and you kind of get a rough ballpark. Is there any kind of requirement like we that? We float some system? questions out uh, first of the year. Okay. Uh, there's no legal requirement. Right. It's kind of a moral. Right. Um, right. Usually these things are fairly well planned long in advance, um, but not a year in advance, you know. Right. We'll often know in that budget year that we're going to have to pay it out at the end of it. We did have a couple of this year, in the current fiscal year, uh, two or three um, retire people folks who have expressed that they were going to retire that we really didn't expect. So mm -hmm. it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, the other major one is under planning. They were overspent, however, Within their budget is something called inspection, and they go out and inspect a subdivision or whatever it is that they're inspecting. And um, we budget 50,000. We also estimate a revenue of 50,000, so that process tends to wash. This year, they've had a lot more costs associated with this inspection. On the reverse side, you'll see on the revenues that their revenues are also up. So um, technically. To me, both of those shouldn't even show through revenues or expenditures. They should be a liability because whatever we pay out, whatever we collect from them, we turn around and pay either uh, engineers or if we don't spend all of the money, they get it back. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, to me, it's a wash. And our fees are intended to cover our costs. So um, you'll, you'll see they'll cancel each other out. We've, okay. We had a great year on permit fees. So just to, sorry, with one more quick question on the general expenditure line. Um, obviously unaudited, you, know, you got to go through and finalize everything. Do you expect, would you expect, might you expect um, a large change in this? I mean, right now we're 3.7% under expenditures. I mean, I, I can understand maybe a, you know, would you see a percent or two one way or another, or do you expect it could go kind of a wide swing either way? I know the only the biggest piece I think if it's not already in here and I'm looking at it thinking it's not is the um, accrued wages, accrued vacation sick. Mm -hmm. Those costs probably have not been posted yet. Um, additionally, that last item 97, which is yeah, other, yeah. those those yeah. are uh, the year-end allocations we make for uh, oh, if there's rescue reserves or or the TIF monies that we get in, we have to set them aside. And, and those types of things. So those are in process as well. So you expect there'll be an adjustment there? Is that oh yeah, that there'll be said? adjustments. Like as I said, I think once if we were to see this report next month, you'll see that these numbers will be different. I'm quite confident that we'll be under budget though. Um, still. Okay. Generally, can you speak? I mean, if you go down and look at like police, fire. I mean, they're pretty significantly under budget. Is there? Mm -hmm. I understand, <coughs> and other there's things that are adjustments coming, but all these others that were pretty significant under. Is there a reason for that? Was it just things they anticipated doing they're not doing? Are there adjustments coming our way? Is that? I, there'll be more adjustments coming. Okay. This is just the initial okay. first run, if you will. When we put together the year-end financial, what we do is we start at, if you will, if you think about the audit, we start at the end of the audit and we work our way to the general fund because essentially everything somewhere somehow flows through here. So we get those all done and then that helps us to decide what we need to do here. So so these numbers will will definitely change. Darn, I thought they'd done a good job at tightening their belt. I, well, mm -hmm. you know, oh, the, thought, the same thing happens with the revenues, so, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So actually, so my question regarding this, the general fund expenses actually ties into the revenue. So I'm going to combine two thoughts here. 
And it's only because in the number of years, it's the first time I've ever seen uh, 62, the community services. Um, even though it's unaudited, it's below budget um, on the expense side and also below budget on the revenue side which is understandable, comparable, but that particular group generally is over budget on both sides and still has a surplus as a result of their activities. Right. Um, do you think that, that you're going to see that change in that? Because that's where a lot of the surplus has come from um, over time um, because of how well their programming is. Mm. Um, do you think that they're going to exceed that? I mean, I, I, do you see what I'm saying? Kind yeah, of, I do. Kind of hit um, that? You know, our cost for let's use recreation programming for instance. Yeah. Um, if we don't have, and I think we've slacked a bit on some of the um, registrations, so we don't have 100 bucks for soccer camp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because we have that extra kid doesn't mean we have extra cost. So there's a fair amount of yep. um, captured cost. You might have to buy an extra t-shirt for that registration. So I think that accounts, the good news is they track perfectly, right? Right. Um, that's a trend that I'll, I'll have to talk more to, to Bill and Bruce about uh, as to whether that's something we should be paying more close attention to in the future. Well, and, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is that, I mean, how many years I've been hounding Bruce, poor Bruce, about the fees, you know, and so when you see this and this being the first year in which we're below budget at both of those, I just want to make sure it's not the fees that are causing any decline. So it's really, you know, what is the participation rate <laughs> this year in comparison? Yeah. Is it going down, staying flat? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the balancing point. We've got to get our fees to the point that they cover costs and ideally turn a, a right. bit of profit, but we don't want to drive business okay. away. That's a delicate um, analysis. I'll talk to Bill and Bruce more about that. Yeah. Thank you. On the expenditures, I just want to point out on the school side, I think we're, we're, there will undoubtedly be some adjustments, but um, they're likely to stay significantly under budget really as a result of that one more debt um, being paid. Oh. Uh, that was in the order of a million bucks alone, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And we will see that as a product of fund balance. Hmm. And then on the revenue side, again, we have the comparative data. So I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, go ahead. Back on the school side, is the um, nutrition program included in the overall school general fund? No, that will show on that page with all the other funds. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the three pieces are adult ed, school general, and okay. nutrition. Where's the nutrition one? I don't see it. It's on the second to the last page. Oh, it's all by itself. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, 7,600 total page. school nutrition. They are about 97% oh, yes. spent and approximately 78% collected. State. Which is, I can attest, is fantastic because usually at this point there's That's why I was about 120 or so. There's been a lot of conversation in the past about the deficit that there, in essence we budget for a deficit in that particular program and why and so I wanted to, so that is, it's actually a very good position to take. Good. And with the new food service director I suspect that has something to do with that gap getting closer. He's doing a lot of different things from purchasing, a purchasing perspective to um, combining a purchasing power with kids. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're actually getting better rates on the purchasing. But most of those, if I recall, most of those deficits were um, revenue generation um, because you got the expenditures, but if they're not offset by revenue, you fill the gap with the, with the difference. Um, I, I, my understanding is um, from sitting in a couple of the meetings is that their, their revenues are actually up, which is... Um, a good thing based on the quality of the food. I think there's a lot more staff as well participating. So I think that's where that gas comes. Not necessarily on the expenditure side, but it's the revenue side that's starting to catch up a little bit too. But maybe we can ask Kate uh, Bolton to give us just a quick little analysis on on the school nutrition. Yeah, I'll do that. On the revenues. So the taxes are up, and pretty much that's um, the result of mostly the excise tax revenues coming in higher than estimated. Wow. Yeah. They alone were about $700,000 above budget. Wow. And they still remain strong this year, too? 
appreciate. Hard to tell. Have, it, have we looked at it? We've got two months under our belt. I haven't checked it. I don't think we're doing too bad, though. Okay, great. Was that 700 in addition to what? Didn't we transfer 100 or something in, during our budget assumptions or something like yeah, that? Yeah, we, we increased our estimate okay. by $300,000. Um, for a total of 5.2, we're collected to, uh, last fiscal year at 5.6. So there's still some wiggle room there. Yeah, Maybe some more to be had going yeah. forward. That's why I was wondering how I was tracking this year. But again, as as if they're buying a new vehicle last year, this year it's a year older, they're paying less yeah. rates. So. Right, right. So is 90 just property taxes? No, no it includes both taxes. Oh, taxes. okay. The vehicle excise tax. It actually includes cable franchise tax. So uh, no, yep. Um, the interest on delinquent taxes is a reflection of, while well, the interest rate stayed the same last year to this year, or the year before to last year, it's, uh, I think, a reflection of the property taxes collected. We're usually around 99%, and while we're Right around 99%. We're not at 99, so um, I think that plays a part into it. Are, are we seeing more default rates? We're we had a higher number, and I don't have that number out of, of of properties that went to lien this year. Okay, a significant <laughs> amount, or is it uh, you know just a slight? No, it was more than slight. I don't know okay. if it was considered. Ten, ten or twelve percent more than we've yeah. seen in recent past. Um, I don't get too worried. Oftentimes, uh, that might be suggestive of people's financial condition, but um, very often they're able to catch up before the lien ever matures. Yeah, it's kind of like she has to start off with like 400 or 500, and by the time she does it, it's down to like 100 or 200 or something yeah. like that. That actually get filed. And okay. So the 10 so the 10 to 12 percent you're talking about that's the net in terms of raw number of yeah. tax lien notices we sent out. Okay. Yeah. Um, intergovernmental revenue, oh, licenses and permits are up, and that's pretty much uh -huh. the result of planning department. There, wow. well, you'll see on the individual selective revenue page that they're building electrical and plumbing permits are all well over 100%. Uh, intergovernmental revenues are at 95%. We, at this point, at this point, we had not received the last payment for the homestead exemption from the state. And veterans or tree growth, they're usually laid on one, if not both of those. So the uh, state's laid on giving us our money. I'm shocked. <laughs> However, I believe <laughs> those have since come in. So the next time we run this report, you'll you'll see a, an increase. Uh, incidentally, state revenue sharing is above projections this year. So good. So that was nice. Ruth, do intergovernmental Intergovernmental revenues include like Old Orchard Beach paying us for dispatch and stuff like that, or is that separate? Services. Uh, we call we put that under charge for services. Yeah, okay. Okay. Which is a perfect walk-in to the three hundred sixty-eight thousand dollar gap. Under government charge for services. Yeah. Sir. So is that purely um, external charge for services? Through like Old Orchard, or is that inter interdepartmental That's charges interdepartmental as well? Interdepartmental as well. And uh, I took a look at those, and I believe, uh, well, part of it is subdivision fees, but part of it has to do with the uh, public works maintains all of our vehicles, and they charge those costs out to the department. And because the fuel costs weren't mm -hmm. as high last year, therefore they didn't get those revenues in because the fuel costs were lower. So each department budget is seeing a, also a reduction in the amount of fuel cost, cost they would yeah. have to, so to spend. So I think that's part of it. I think it's the biggest part of it. Yeah. You yes. also see it lower on the flip side, the lower expenditure side. So it's right. That's right. Yeah. And then just as with the expenditures, the other financing sources are partially done. We're in process of doing those. And that's all year-end <coughs> adjustments. And Ruth, I'm sorry. Could you could you just give me an update on other financing sources? What is what is that? Just a that's the uh, if we have, for example, the school development impact fees that we the planning department collects. We take two years ago 
actual, and that becomes our revenue for this year estimate. And um, those may or may not have been transferred yet. So it's those types of things that um, are part of year-end transfers that may or may not have been done, or, or if they've been done, they haven't been posted yet. So that's just, I mean, it looks like a significant delta. You wouldn't imagine it being that large at the end of all the transistors. There's still probably things that need to transfer in. Or there are still things to be transferred. Just as with the expenditure side, it looked yeah. like it was underspent, but it's just a lot that still haven't been done. Tom, just, just a quick question. If you look at, you know, the percentage increase mm -hmm. in building permits and plumbing permits and those types of things, that would suggest there must be a lot of investment going on in real estate. Is there, is it, what's the delay between the building permit activity and when that valuation works its way into what we use for the tax base? I mean, are we talking 12 to 18 months? Are we talking? Yeah, I would say that 18 would be the outside. So, so I know we've had a lot of conversation in the past, and I know with the analysts coming on, whether a project might be having something to do with looking at the permits in the past and trying mm -hmm. to project what that's going to do to property values so we have a better sort of a real estate. If, I mean, that's been just a conversation. Yeah. How do we get a better handle on Yeah, the only, the only complication with that is assessments are as magically as of April 1. So you can, we can do some of that forecasting, uh, but it really depends how far along they are in the construction and therefore what value is created as of April 1st. Yeah. Um, so there's just a, another variable in that analysis. Is, it, is there any value for a project or um, project that's in construction? Yeah, partial, sure. Other yeah, than raw land. It, it, gets, it, it can get fairly complicated trying to get that partial value, for sure. Do you have the information when they, when they file these things on what the total project cost is going to be? Yep, you, it's part you, of the building permit application is to estimate value. Yes, yeah, so you have an estimated so, what the, so yeah. Well. Would, it, would it be, I mean, I don't know what kind of administrative challenges would be, but um, it strikes me, and I think a president brought this up to me some time ago about, uh, so if we assess at April 1st, and it's mm -hmm. a one year, uh, if they complete construction April 2nd, that's almost a full year where they're not assessed right. at a... But presumably they're assessed at 99% or something for that year. Right, so I guess my question would be, it would, would it make sense to, or can we do it in six-month increments, let's say, or something, to try and capture more of that, or does it not, it doesn't really matter either way, or there's a reason why we couldn't... Well, state law requires okay. April 1st is the date that everyone uses. So uh, I don't think we have any flexibility in that regard. Uh, but I do think we can we can use this information to forecast when we might expect that value to actually be realized into the age-old discussion of what's our value right. going to be next right. year. Right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very positive trend. This is the first yeah, very sure. robust year. That's you know, amazing. I think we're all with a bit of uh, you know, bated breath wondering are we out of the woods? Are we really seeing a resurgence in yeah. building? And yeah. this just confirms it that, uh, yes, we absolutely are. You know, regarding the tax line, um, it's still, you know, until, the, until you actually look at the breakdown, just to keep in mind, because you actually kind of warned us when we were going through the budget process, well, this is extremely positive. I mean, there's a variance of $670,000 extra in, in taxes. Um, we took a chance this past year and said, well, we are comfortable in believing that there was going to be 300000 and we budgeted for that, so there's really an additional on top of that. Um, I just don't want us to get too far where every year, I mean, yeah, excise is speaking in short <laughs> clips here because in my head I'm running through the comment, but I just want to be careful going forward because you never know when that's going to bottom out. You just never, I mean, I mean, the real estate taxes are exact. We, we know what we're going to collect, whether right. we collect it in this fiscal year, at some point or another, we're going to be made whole. Yeah. So there's really no float there. The excise is the one that really does, so uh, and, and it continues to exceed my, I'll say, pessimistic yeah. uh, outlook. I, I just can't believe that people continue to buy new cars year in, year out. Um, mm. It's not as if we're plateauing. We continue this ascent. I, I also think it's important to look at that, too, um, even if we're not spot on in the budgeting for the year. If we're over, it goes into general funds. So we've got that on balance. So I'd, I'd be hesitant to try and get too reliant on predicting that number right. directly um, from a year to year basis um, because if it's good, um, you know, it, we're going to see the benefits of that. If it's not good and we've relied on it, uh, that could pose other challenges. Well, the good news is that we can be, I think, confident that our 
increased budget for exercise this year will meet. Yep. We will likely exceed. So yeah. that should give us some baseline confidence. Right. Um, everything else is great. Yeah. It's really good. I, I, it highlights a topic that we're bringing up later, which is the fund balance policy, because that becomes more and more important as that number becomes stable. So. Good. Yeah, yeah, and the final piece is this, as we get as we're trying to tighten up our budgets on the expenditure side, there's not as much float. There's not as much left over unexpended. So to the point of right. you know wanting to build fund balance, really the only way we do it in a significant way is to exceed in, in revenue um, as our budgets get tighter and tighter and tighter. Mm. The um, I kind of skipping over the year-to-date expenditures and revenues, which are just the, unless you have specific questions, we kind of went over them already. Um, the, the next one is all of the different funds that we have. There are a few lines that have budgets most, actually most of them do. Yep. But it's hard to, on, on the capital item, they may be projects from last the prior year that weren't finished in 15 that are now in six that were finished in 16 but the budget's in 15 so it tends to look skewed yeah yeah like the first line <laughs> <laughs> which is um well special revenue funds all of the what is in special revenue funds most of the grant revenues come in through that uh, so that might be a good chunk of that same with the Fund 72 XXs, those are all pretty much school grants also. Sure. Any other comments or questions for Ruth and Tom? In the last sheet, you, you probably have already flipped ahead and looked yeah. at it, but that really accentuates the excise and, and the permit revenues that we And just to kind of put it in perspective, uh, for the fiscal year 17, for the current fiscal year, Excise, we put it 5.2. Uh, building permits at 385. Plumbing permits at 41,000. And electrical at 52. So uh, we're still you know, within, below the actual uh, for last fiscal year. And the other piece, too, is that, you know, we put a lot of these budgets together, like the 17 budget we started in you know, almost 18 months prior to mm -hmm. the start of the fiscal year. And we do make adjustments along the yep. way. But just, just a quick question in summary then. If you, if, if you just go back to the first page and you look at actual revenues and expenditures, that would suggest, you know, a $2.6 million surplus, if you will, but you have adjustments. So, Tom, you said you still think we're going to have a surplus, but, I mean, how big would a bread box? Sorry, your best guess. I mean, are we half a million or so after the adjustments are made? Are we going to be north of that? There should be at least a million. At least a million from what we're at. Uh, I'm certain of that. Yeah. It's going to be, Okay. I hate to be so, not, I'm trying not to be flippant, but it's going to be no less than a million, no more than two point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to be somewhere in the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that I do my best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that narrows it down. I mean, if I were a betting man, I would say we'll be adding uh, modestly to fund balance in addition to the expected so Wentworth money. Yeah. So, so somewhere a couple hundred thousand dollars, you think, is... <laughs> yeah. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind. So Thank you. I, I guess the takeaway from this is obviously there's a lot of things in motion. There's nothing, there's nothing critical right now that stands out to us that is going to be an issue. If, at least I'm no. misinterpreting that. Um, so, you know, it's hard to draw really firm conclusions based on what we got, but it's a good snapshot of where we're at right now. We're doing very well um, right. compared to others, and, and when things finalize out and they get audited, we'll, we'll be able to do some more training, some more analysis, and really kind yeah, of start The big the picture apart. is we didn't overexpend, okay. yeah. and we brought in more revenue. So I, I, I think the simple takeaway is that I, there's no surprises. In fact, I think there's right. going to be positive news here. So the question I have in closing on this particular topic is that um, to have a comparative, internally comparative, after these adjustments, um, would we be able to, just for our own um, uh, review, would we be able to get an updated, the same exact package in um, September so that we can see what that adjustment, the impact was? 
they say that again. The, this same package you get at the um, in September for the end of just to made. see what the changes were, so that we can yeah. kind of understand. Because it's important to understand that I mean this is all a point in time, you know, right. so it's static information it's based on that. Right. So you know, while it's yeah. unaudited, I think it would be great to see that, mm -hmm. knowing that that still is a point yeah. in time until the audit happens. October, November, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Changing. Go ahead. Just a quick question, I guess, for you as chair. Um, if we do end up the year in a, a sweet spot, um, last year we had some conversation about. And I think it's probably just a, an agenda item at some point before a year and if we can do it is, you know, there is, we do have some unfunded liabilities. It is, should we start thinking about, you know, putting a placeholder on the balance sheet for those things? So it's just a question for, not for tonight, but in particular, I think it's pension that's unfunded, right? Our pensions? <coughs> pensions are in... Uh, we have a liability, but not necessarily any fund balances for... Correct. Fund balance, uh, <coughs> pension, and then the other post-employment benefits, which yeah. is the health Medical. insurance piece. Yeah. So I know we talked about that at one point, Tom, so just yeah. wondering whether we should circle back and figure out if we want to have a policy or a strategy for Absolutely. starting to put funds away for that liability because it's coming at some point. And I think that personally, and you know, I'll do whatever you, um, the three of us would like to do, and as long as the time per, per <coughs> permits. Um, because that is a great conversation leading up to the budget process. So, um, you know, we can definitely put it on, you know, we can figure that part out. Because I, I need to understand it a little bit better. Because the, the account, I remember this was brought up with the audit. It's, remember with the audit? Um, yeah. It was brought up then, and they said that it, it is not required for us it's to do that, right. but it is something that in the future we we're should now, consider? We're now so reporting I, I, need to, I need to remember that. Yeah, what we're now happened? reporting it, and I think the auditor kind of foreshadowed the fact that we have to report it. it it's it's coming be, down the it's line. It's coming down the line, it. and it's a big number. So just if we have any extra funds okay. ever. And chances <laughs> are this isn't just going to, you know, go down at any point. It's probably just going to continue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was it was a and number that you don't want to be surprised all in one year. To it was like a million dollars, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Couple million. Yeah, I think I get. And um, I'm not 100 percent certain, but that actually might be a subset of the fund balance policy because this would have to. This would in okay. essence be a fund that would be created. Yeah, and you would re would reserve it as a sign, so it, it would carry yeah. on as part of the fund balance, but it's or restricted. Be it, like your accrued teachers' liability, yeah. almost you know, salaries or. I I I'd suggest we wait until we get a better handle on what we've got to 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 work with mm -hmm. first. So maybe in September when we get the new package yeah. and it's finalized, then we can. Look at where we're at and, and what we've got. Moving forward, <laughs> it won't be finalized. I'll just no, no, no. I don't know if I'm audited, right? Oh, but I mean, we'll, but all of the all of the Close adjustments to. should be relatively completed by then, I would assume, right? And then should be, yeah, yeah. So oh, I think we should foreshadow yeah. um, the topic as part of the fund balance policy conversation, yeah. Yeah. so that we can include the language. Mm -hmm. At the very least, we can get the policy done, and then the next budget can take care of whether to allocate funds to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of it's good in my head right now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Tom, I, I wrote all over mine. Can I get a clean copy? I'd like to actually present it at the next council meeting as part of the finance committee report. Copy of uh, the uh, finance report? Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And um, moving on to discussion, dashboarding and trend analysis. To kind of get that started, Tom, do you want to talk about progress regarding the yeah, new position? Yeah, Tom and I kicked this around. It may be, a, I think it's a bit premature in that it's important to start talking about this, but uh, this is exactly the, the wheelhouse, if you will, of this uh, budget uh, analyst that I, I envision. I really want this person to dig deep. Uh, this is priority number one, if you will. If you're interested, I do have a copy of the final job description. I'm out uh, soliciting as we speak. And... Uh, it's, uh, interestingly, with this position, I chose rather than a date certain for closing, you know, the deadline. Uh, I've kept it open until filled. Just I anticipated it being a challenge, and I'm willing to wait, frankly, if I need to. Um, but I'm very pleased. I've had probably 35 resumes, wow. and a couple of very intriguing ones. Wow, that's good. Um, I just would direct your attention, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time now, but the essential functions down on the bottom of the first page, um, one, two, three, four, five, and 11 kind of all speak to this 
aspect of, of the job responsibilities. The rest of it is the purchasing agent and uh, some other administrative functions. So I, I just wanted to provide that to you just to show you that and demonstrate that this is really the thrust of the position. It's a finance first position, if you will. Uh, having said that, Sean was kind enough uh, at his own expense, I might add, to do uh, some research and bought some really good manuals that I think will serve as um, great fodder for understanding what metrics we should be identifying. Uh, some of these books, I mean, there's probably 50 different metrics. Um, I don't expect all of them will make sense for us. If we can come up with half a dozen or eight or ten, and I see that as a collaborative process with the finance committee, um, but I really would like the analysts to dig into it and, and be in a position to make some recommendations to you. Um, Sean, you, you had mentioned you did provide these documents. These are the things you you found to your colleagues on the finance committee. If not, yes and no. On the top of your package, is that the smaller one? Well, there's three yep. things. Well, this is oh, from the state of New York. Comptroller's office. Oh, and no, then okay. We have yeah, you have the white paper? Yes, Guide to yeah. Financial. So, just as a highlight, if you recall, um, so I had done a little bit of research um, preliminarily and provided with what is called the white paper. And what it is, it's really, I don't remember the author's name, but it, it came, he was part of ICMO, which is the, um, I believe it's called County. International, International City, City Management County Association. Management Association. Yep. And in that, it really highlights what. Um, uh, city and municipal government can look at as financial trends and performance in the categories and just to um, bring it up to the global level or at least the uh, higher level rather than the minutia you know you're looking at debt you're looking at capital you're looking at debt to capital you're looking at liquidity and other factors and this I mean if you think about it this is about anything that you want you can actually do a type of trend and then do a comparative so that provides at least an outline of some recommendations being um, bored, I guess, one night, I went online and I actually <laughs> bought the full manual that is um, referenced and gave Tom a copy. I'd be happy to give either of you a copy as well. But it's actually called Evaluating Financial Conditions, a Handbook for Local Governments. And it's a really good, and actually not only does it provide you with the uh, formula on how to take it, um, but it talks about the methodology, it talks about the pros and the cons with it, as well as then how to do the next step level of analysis and really expound on that. What I was hoping to do is really, um, while Tom is preparing this um, hire, is for us to take into consideration is that my vision for that particular position, even though I'm not, is that they become a quant. You know, um, you name it, they're going to track the trend of whatever it might be, population, everything you can think of. And then as a board, we'll ask for an executive summary that includes five or six major areas. Um, I know, Tom, you have a couple of recommendations mm -hmm. that you were talking about. Um, that are bigger, we can still get the smaller pieces as part of the analysis because everyone likes to know, you know, the, the smaller minutiae part of it. But I really want us to look at trends amongst those major categories. So whether it's debt per capita or expenses or whatever it might be, you need to look at not a year-to-year -year snapshot and the changes, but what has been the last three years, the last five years, and then set goals based upon those if they are truly representative of where we want to be financially. Um, would it be helpful if I copied one or all of these documents for you so you can get, start to get a flavor of the, the sort of territory that we're likely to cover? Well, I think we, have the, we definitely have the purple that one. one. Do we have the white paper, too? I don't, I don't well, know you, the white paper. You have the white paper. You don't have this one. Not the full manual. Would you like one? I, I, I would certainly welcome that. My only, okay. I don't know if we can just photocopy them and give them out. If we have copyright. We, yeah, do we have to, we'll probably have to purchase a couple of copies, I presume, right? I'll check. I don't know what the... I'll check. Because it's through ICMA, I suspect yeah. it's intended to be shared and used widely. Okay. Yeah, I don't I think mean, it's copyright protected. What, whatever it is, I mean, even if we have an expenditure, I just I don't want us to get in trouble for <laughs> you know, plagiarizing you know, or right. anything like that. Um, I, will, I, I, will have, I will have to check my invoice because I actually purchased this personally. Right. So, I, so. I, would, I would welcome that opportunity, certainly. Oh, we can, we can uh, purchase it, too, and yeah. Yeah. through the town. And that right. way it'll so, um, so, from a... Coming perspective, Sean, yes. what are you thinking about? Uh, so the analysts will be hired. So it's really up to Tom in this hiring because it's going to take. By, by the way, so the, <laughs> um, funding structure. Th th this is this is not going to happen in six it's months, just, right? Yeah. Because it's going to take them time to get um, the databases put together and then to do that. So it's going to take a year, probably, before you have a complete. 
I was hoping personally that we pick maybe four or five things and we start looking at them where they're more, um, they're easily calculable type of trends. Mm -hmm. So whether it's uh, debt per population or if it's expenses or whatever it might be, um, those are easy kind of fixes to just so that we can start getting a feel of looking at a dashboard. Because there's going to be a training piece for us, the three of us probably not as much because we're more financially, we have a higher financial acumen maybe than some, but I think the rest of the council will need to also go through and kind of understand how it's been put together and why it's important, okay. why it was selected. So um, a quick question, does, does, I mean, we talked about this in the past with maybe uh, Maine Municipal Association. I know that they've, they've, what they're using for trending in general. I'd, I'd like to kind of see if there's, does the state have any kind of broad base indicators that they use to evaluate towns or anything like that? I mean, we certainly can come up mm -hmm. with what we want, uh, mm -hmm. and I think it's good to have our own, you know, feel and our own metrics of what we're looking at and why, but I'd also like to, uh, if we could, uh, you know, I'd rather reinvent the wheel. If there's something that MMA does, uh, you know, they have five or six criteria that they try and use for all towns or all municipalities or something like that. That might be helpful as well, just to kind of benchmark us in other yeah. in other groups. Um, you know, our own obviously we're responsible for our own fiscal health, but um, it might be a good reference too to see what what other metrics might be out there. I suspect for good benchmarking data, we're going to have to probably carry the water on that. Um, with and, and there's such great disparities in the state of Maine in terms of you know there's 500. Municipalities, Scarborough is at the, you know, in the, in the top five percent in terms right. of by any measure, basically. So, um, MMA tries to cater to all 500 as they should. Sure. Um, so I think benchmarking it might make sense for us to spend some time to identify comparable communities and then really get some usable data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I just I, I think it's part. I mean, that's part of what I would expect or yeah. that would be part of the process when we sit down and develop what metrics we want and what, what criteria we're going to use to evaluate. I just, you know, if we oh, get a little bit ahead, work ahead of time and, you know, while, while the analyst is coming on and we're doing <coughs> our own homework, you know, if there's I'd other sources we can look at. Yeah. Yeah. So we can... Personally, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, two things. One is um, in doing the research to prepare for the conversation, I did talk to MMA and they really aren't a source of data analytics uh, for any type of benchmarking. However, when we talked with the auditor, I think that the auditor that we currently have actually represents quite a few that would be in our peer group. And if we provide him with, here are the tools, or here are the measures that we want. Can you come back and give us, you know, we don't necessarily need to know where the town of Falmouth is, but give us an average of our peer group or give us the median or wh whatever that benchmark is. Personally, I don't want to get into an analytical, uh, analytical discussion of, um, do we want to be like where the town of Falmouth is or the town of Cable is? Scarborough is Scarborough, and we need to set our own goals and determine that we can use that as a benchmark to see where we've been in comparison to them. But I've never enjoyed a conversation where, well, the town of Cape Elizabeth has per pupil expenses higher than us, and who cares? I, I want to know what we're doing. So. Do you think it would be worthwhile, just as the school did their survey and they had all of these communities, and then based on the criteria or something, they eliminated some of them like based on I don't know food services or whatever it is so um, we can compare ourselves to other communities like you know Lewiston because they're up there in terms of population but um, they're not like Scarborough so you know I in my opinion but does that mean we should compare them or we shouldn't compare them so that might be something to look at as well. I would take the recommendation of the auditor since he um, yeah. since they have a greater data um, base broad understanding of our peer group, but I would hope it stayed very similar to the peer group that was um, designed or identified for the school department's criteria. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's a point of discussion. You know, yeah. we can, we can, uh, you know, I, I, I think we should put a little thought into this instead of just kind of, yeah. and we will. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, I think it's, you know, um, if there are other trending information out there, whether it's the MMA or the state, I'm just looking at other mm -hmm. other ways other people evaluate things. And, and to your point, Sean, I mean, obviously what we do here is important because we're responsible for our fiscal responsibility, but if other districts or other other towns or municipalities have good ideas, sure. you know. Um, no, and, and uh, using, <laughs> for comparative purposes, uh, boiling things down to per capita spending or revenues, mm. right. uh, you know, you can eliminate differences mm -hmm. sure. between communities. Sure. Um, I will say, by the way, when I did the research, I could not find one 
Maine community that had a true financial analysis um, presentation, like a complete one. Even Portland? Even Portland. Not that it was readily out there as far You're as, I mean, you go into New York and Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts, you can find many, many communities that that's part of the budgetary process in which they do all of this. Mm -hmm. Could not find one in Maine. Be the trendsetter. Go ahead. Tom, this is kind of a question because I think you brought up, I think, Tom, didn't, in the RFP we did this year too, didn't we ask them to actually maybe provide us with some metrics that we may want to consider that would be, in their judgment, we did. important for us as a town to look at? That may be a great starting point. Absolutely. Ask them to say, come back to us with yeah. four or five of these dashboards. That gives us a starting point to say, yeah, we think that's good for Scarborough or yeah. it's not good for Scarborough or we want to, but that might really help kind of jumpstart this process. And part of uh, identifying those metrics or indicators is also identifying, you know, warning flags. If we right. dip below yeah. this, yeah. Right. then not, we don't have to dictate what response it elicits, but it's something that we should stop and check and understand before we move forward. So I, I, I think we can make significant progress in identifying a handful of yeah. mutually agreed upon indicators um, in time for this upcoming budget. That's yeah. my intent. And ultimately, if we can get this stuff down, I would love this person to actually move into more of the performance management end of things, yep. um, really drilling further down in, in the details of what we do and how we do it. And, um, but that's kind of phase two or three. Absolutely. Anything else? So we'll Great. make copies and provide you a, um, a copy of this so long as I think you're okay with it. Yep. Yep. Uh, next topic is capital planning policy. Before I, I turn this over to Tom and um, um, Ruth, I just wanted to give a, a refresh memory, refresh of what's happened. So back in 2014, the Finance Committee, which included uh, Peter and I and then, at the, um, and then um, Bill Donovan, began this process of really talking about capital planning as a, res as, um, as a result of budgeting. And what that is is really related to are there capital projects and capital equipment purchases that could be incorporated into the operating budget um, based on its dollar value, its use, its um, life, uh, life, um, uh, life cycle, and um, not fund that by long-term debt? And what would the impact of that be? So as a refresh, um, in 2014, the, the Finance Committee did approve but did not forward onto the council the, um, the uh, policy because we wanted to, at least for the past year, run a pilot to see what was the impact, how would it work, um, whether or not we, you know, it was truly something beneficial. So we're kind of at that point now because it has been in our committee for two years. Um, the, the question is, do we want to now send this on to the town council for full consideration or do we want to table it and not actually um, have the policy go forward? And where are we with that? So. With that, can I turn it over to you, Tom and Ruth? Sure. Um, on, uh, yeah, picking up right where you left off, uh, you may recall Ruth was tasked as we prepared this current year's budget with doing an analysis of um, what does this new policy mean? How, how would the capital budget look? Is it different at all when we employ this policy? And she started to do that, and I think produced a spreadsheet, and it. it it got terribly confusing, and I don't think we actually completed that. Uh, but I, I will say that we we tried our best to follow this policy in this current year. Um, I guess an editorial note for me, one thing I've learned that I think is most important, uh, it's not which budget it sits in, it's how it's funded. And I think that's a bit of a some misunderstanding around that, though something may be in capital, many of those items, smaller value items and less life expectancy items, consumable type, type things are funded with appropriations. And so I think to me that's the most important standard that we're not borrowing for something that, um, right. you know, for a longer period than its useful life, for instance. I mean, that's the, that's the fatal flaw. And I think we've actually been doing that fairly well through the years, even better this past year, I think. Um, the draft that was submitted out in your packet, um, you'll You'll note that um, in the definition section, there was still a dollar, some dollar figures not assigned. I'd looked back through some of my past graphs and I had annotated it. I'd actually, I think this committee decided to remove any reference to the dollar figure in the definitions and rely on them in the, in the, 
in the text. And so uh, for capital improvement project, um, basically you put a period after multi-year life period. And then for capital equipment, it would be after the word equipment. Yep. Yep. Uh, just we, that change didn't get picked up on this draft. I think it's worth talking about, though, whether the $100,000 um, number is the right one. And there might be some appetite and interest in, in reducing that. Again, the principle of how we pay for it is what's most important, I think. And it's not necessarily addressed all that well in this document. So forgive me, Sean, I don't have much more to offer no, than that's, that. I think that's, that's kind fine. of where we're at. Uh, questions, comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess my my only concern is is obviously balancing fiscal responsibility with handicapping a budget process in terms of we put a fixed dollar amount in and automatically kicking in certain triggers and certain policies that have to come into play. Um, um, I don't. Looking at this, I guess my my question is what are we what are we trying to accomplish? If we're trying to accomplish getting out more operational based expenditures yeah. than than yeah. what um, you know what we or one individual might consider capital um, you know that might be a topic of discussion on 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 each budget you know um, in, in terms of Tom's point where it's going to be funded from and and to how, what extent and how um, so um, I, I mean that, that's just kind of my personal standpoint I don't I don't know if I, I, I kind of struggled with the dollar value amount um, I think the concept's there from my perspective. I think it's, you know, it's, it's always good to have those discussions of, uh, you know, where things belong in the budget and how much to what extent. I'm just always cautious of putting in, you know, circuit breakers or, or, or hard points in there that, that might supersede our, this, this uh, committee's ability or even the council's ability to manage a policy, manage a budget. So that would be uh, an example, we buy, we've been buying one plow truck a year. And it's about 180,000 bucks by the time you buy the truck and get it properly equipped. And that puts us on a replacement schedule of about every 15 years. We've got 14 plow routes. Um, so by definition, by policy, that's something we do every year. I suppose it could be in the um, operating budget. Um, but I think there's also a you know, the theory of if we're able to borrow money at 2 to 3%, which is quite consistent, we're able to do that. There's some theory to financing those over time, and we've got enough time, given that type of product, to certainly um, pay down that long-term borrowing at low interest well before the item is out of service. Um, so it, it, we found that it doesn't fit perfectly in all situations. Buses are another example. Uh, we're on a track of buying at least one, if not more, every year. But why doesn't that? So I, I'm not. Why doesn't that fit this scenario we set up here? I mean, even, even with a hundred thousand, both of those are things that, geez, they last more than five yeah. years. It's, you know, they're more than a hundred thousand. They should be capitalized. That it seems like that. Fair enough. I mean, I, I, I think it, to answer your question, Chris, I, I think where we're trying to go, and I think it's important. Most corporations do have some type of capital policy, mm -hmm. because in, and I, I think this came up really in context of the way that our constituents see the budget, mm -hmm. the more stuff that we put into capital that requires financing and funding, they don't really see the items in the budget per se. All they really see is whatever we think the debt service is going to be. So this was really an attempt, I think, to try to put some framework around how can we make it, how can we make sure that things that we're putting in capital really are capital items. And most corporations do do it around similar to this. They have some type of life expectancy and they have some type of dollar threshold saying we don't want to capitalize every thousand dollar item we buy, but we, we want to put, you know, so I, I think that was how this got framed. Um, I guess my position would be I think it's important that we do have some type of capital policy so when conversations come up we can at least have the conversation. The council always has the ability in the budget process to elect not to necessarily follow that policy. But at least there's a guideline. I mean, they can, you know, I mean, it's, you can have that conversation. But I'd rather have at least something we can point to to say, here was the original intent, here's why, and, and have kind of a living document that we can modify over time. It was just sort of a thought. Yeah. 
So I wonder if, if um, and I, I, I agree 100% where you're coming from. That, you know, obviously we have to be responsible with our, our capital, and we have to be transparent also with where that comes from. I'm wondering if it, if it would behoove us um, to break down capital a little bit more clearly. With, I mean, right now we do mention the funding mechanisms, but we don't, we don't really call them out as much, maybe. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, if it's, um, you know, incumbent upon us to explain that a little bit better as well to say. You know, if the capital budget's two and a half million dollars, um, we're only going to bond X number of that. The rest of that's going to come under either, you know, uh, expenditures or lease or something like that. So, so maybe a, 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 I don't know if there is a clearer way to present that, or if there's a, a better way to present that. Um, and I, I mean, again, I, I, to your point, I, I, I think it's good to have. I, I would definitely agree with kind of a, a general capital policy of, you know, what, what our guidelines should be in terms of, mm -hmm. and it's just when we start getting into hard numbers and hard triggers that I, that I, that I kind of get worried about, you, you know what I mean? Because I think if, if we take the dollar value out of this, um, you know, um, I think that it still could be the basis of discussions when, when, the, when the budget cycle rolls around, right? Or, or, or do you, would that take too much teeth out of it, if you will, and be too vague? The, the, the amounts that are listed are really just for the borrowing piece, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to you know appropriations or whatever. I did look at the current year 17's capital equipment and capital budgets. We do have a couple of items that we're bonding: floor sweeper, HVAC, efficiency upgrades. Those are like 62 and 82 thousand that plan to be budgeted, uh, to be bonded, as well as some uh, athletic equipment furnishings things of that nature, and that was under capital equipment, and then we have <coughs> some Gorm Road construction, mm -hmm. things like that that are, you know, below the $100,000 threshold, but are but still, still good, candidate good candidates for, for some level of borrowing. Financing, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes it's three years, it's not 28 or anything, you know, it, de it depends on the item. I mean, I still maintain the value of having the capital budget is you're able I think there's a bit of, there may be a, historically a bit of concern that we hid things in the capital budget. Um, I think it's important to separate out those unique expenses that can change year to year um, because we're always held to such a high standard that why is your budget up this percent over last year? Well, these sorts of things can really be the tail that wags the dog. If you can isolate them by putting them in the capital budget, it doesn't have this sort of yo-yo effect on your operating. It's not about hiding them somewhere. It's about for year over year and comparative value, being able to um, not have those kinds of wide fluctuations that, that really make the comparative process really hard. You've got to go back and back some things out for apples to apples. <clears throat> so um, two things. One is to Chris's point regarding how we, um, it gets to, to me, it gets to the point of how do we communicate the capital budget to the public so that they can understand and have greater confidence mm -hmm. in that. And I'm trying to recall the presentation of the capital budget, but I think that a summary sheet that breaks down the capital budget by, uh, is that, they're all embedded within each department's budget first in one presentation, and then there's the capital budget as a whole. Is there also a presentation where all the um, mm -hmm. appropriated uh, capital budgets are in one section together and what the total is than all that are in long-term debt or short-term debt. Uh, you see, you see where you I'm like. going with the summary style? Right. Yeah, we can show it any way you like. The yeah. way we do it now is we list all the projects and we indicate what their funding yep. source is. Uh, we could yep. we could change I think from a communication it. maybe next year if we just group them by, put all of the allocated ones in one summary sheet so that they can see, not allocated, appropriated, mm -hmm. um, and then a, an explanation on the table that says this is going to be funded by tax base. Um, or it's all funded by tax rates, about appropriations. The next one is maybe short-term debt that's less than five years and then long-term debt that's greater than yeah. five years and break down that, so that way we can communicate it. The other piece, though, is that this is about decision-making and not really communicating. Right. And the only issue that I have is that um, it's not really an issue. I just want to make sure if we're going to approve this, no matter what that level is, there needs to be a commitment to follow it. Um, unless there are significant or serious economic conditions that force us not to. And when we go over a financial statement that shows us in a very good position that we're in, 
I want to make sure that if we're going to pass this and recommend it and the council passes it, that we're going to follow it in the budget cycle. Is, is where I, want, I want to see it. Right. Um, unless something really serious. Um, I'm happy with the 100000 um, because it sounds like actually, um, so first of all, you had mentioned the bullets. So bullet number five um, is pretty clear. We are going to determine the funding source of the project being approved, which includes appropriations. The next bullet is really a, the long-term debt, which is greater than 100000 and then short-term debt is less than 100000 so um, while there isn't a specific mention to appropriated um, funding, um, I consider that as part of that very first one we talked about. So I see this really as a policy statement and not necessarily a rigid guideline. Yeah, there's some flexibility built. There's some flexibility. There but I'll be honest with you, um, looking at this policy and looking at the items that Ruth mentioned, I would say that they should not be in a bonding situation. Athletic equipment should not be in a bonding, yeah, right? I mean, based on this policy. Outside of any other uh, kind of um, ex exterior opinions or facts, based on this policy, we should really be looking. Well, no, excuse me, we could be doing short-term debt yeah. on that or appropriations. You, have, you actually have to, you actually have. It's not forcing you to do appropriations. It's either short-term or the appropriation piece. It, it strikes me the challenge that we're having, or one of the challenges we seem to be having, is identifying what really is capital and what's not capital equipment, and and what that definition is, because. Um, again, um, if you buy, for example, uh, let's say you buy a wrestling mat, a wrestling mat lasts 20 years, um, and you can finance it at 2%. Why wouldn't you do that? To Tom's point, it's another piece of, it's another expenditure, another investment that the town's making long term, and we're going to get the value out of that. So, um, I would be, um, you know, uh, I think that's another piece that we kind of struggle with. What, what, by definition, is a piece of capital equipment? We even talked about that, I recall, in our, our last meeting when we discussed this earlier. You know, what, what, what is that? Is it just on a dollar value? Is it finance? Is it based on how we're going to pay for that? Is it based on um, longevity, use? Um, so, so I, I mean, I think, I think to me the real question is, is um, if we're using metrics, and let's say we're using debt, Right, and right now that's a significant metric that we're that we're looking at. What kind of debt burden does the town have? Um, that would kind of obviously preclude people to think, well, we're borrowing a lot of money. <laughs> Why are we borrowing all this money? Uh, should we still be borrowing money? Um, then the question becomes, you know, not so much. Um, what are we spending that money on? But why are we borrowing it? And that goes back to how we're going to fund it, and how we're going to pay for it. Um, I think if we're going to have a, you know, if we're going to it's a difficult discussion to say, you know, justify buying 200 chairs for town hall and bonding it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, where, where if we have the reserves, you know, we should pay cash for that, maybe. If we don't, if it makes more financial sense, we at least have the flexibility to look at that. So I think that I think it's good to have a capital. The, the, as I said, the, the the policy would be good, um, but I still think it's more. It should be used more as a basis for the discussion and not as a means to frame the discussion and say, if it fits in this box, this is what it does. If it's box B, this is what it does. Box C, this is what it does. So if we could, if we could kind of come up with a, um, and I hate policies that are very vague in general, in nature, because they're very difficult to, to implement. But I think in this instance, we, I, I would want to maintain as much flexibility as we could. As long as we can communicate it clearly, what we're doing, why we're doing, and how we're doing it, um, and, yeah. and, you know, we can justify I that. I think we may have threaded that needle. I'm not sure if we could do any better job, frankly. Yeah. I think it, um, just to add some clarity, that athletic equipment was for replacement of a pole vault mat and batting cages. So there's not bats and balls, not real consumables, right. but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, did I just I pick yeah. up? You know, I, think, I think you were on to something you said earlier, but I think what constituents have asked for or might want to see is and I think what we're trying to address is, yeah, if you put stuff into capital and it's finance, people don't understand what impact that has on the mill rate, not this year, but down the road. But So to get to your point, if we did, when we communicate, if we had a way of communicating, here's the capital items, here's the impact it's going to have on the mill rate going forward. And we had talked about, gee, is there a way that we could try to do a better job of predicting you know, yes, there's tons of variables, 
but do a little bit more planning so we can say, geez, look, sitting here now and knowing we've got $48 million worth of municipal expenditures that we're talking about, we don't have the number for the schools, but the schools is a number maybe similar to that. You know, how do we sort of let constituents know how these things are going to impact over the next three years? So I think if, if, if the way we communicate is here's the stuff that's in the capital budget, this is what it's going to add, you know, as a cost, then you're aware, and I think that's a, an impactful way of doing it. And then going back to corporations, corporations are a little different because they have all their capital stuff is depreciated, so there's IRS guidelines. But again, the way it is set up, it's really meant to be a filter to say, you know, we don't want to capitalize a thousand dollar items. They're looking for things that have a duration more than a year and a certain dollar threshold. So I think that, I think that was sort of the, the concept here of trying to, to get to that place. We're not really, and maybe to get to your point, I don't know if this needs to address how we make the funding decisions, whether it is appropriations or borrowing. I don't know if that belongs in here, Sean, or someplace else. Yeah, so um, a couple of points. First is, um, I believe, under IRS guidelines for regular business, it's a the limitation is, I think it's $1,000 in a useful life greater than a year, you can capitalize, but it's, a, it's an internal decision, it's a corporate decision, corporate but, th but that's the threshold in which you can at least yes. do that. Um, to, to Chris's point about um, how do we define what's actually capital equipment, I actually believe the definitions actually helps us do that already. What's not defined is um, uh, actually the adjective major. So it's a major expenditure used to expand or improve government's equipment. So I think the reason why originally we had that line in there, the red line to put in a dollar amount, was really that identifies what is major. Is it 50,000, is it 100,000? So that I believe was the original purpose. Um, because according to this, I would suggest that it is a capital equipment purchase for the athlete. I don't like using one particular group, especially this mm -hmm. particular group, but that would be a capital equipment purchase. The funding piece, to, to your point, is back to the bullets. You know, the fifth bullet, sixth bullet, is determine the funding source for the project being improved. And there are three that are available. The next two bullets cover the funding piece, or uh, sorry, the financing, the long and short term financing piece. But, you know, maybe the other bullet should be, one of the other bullets should be about appropriations, you know, that any amount could be appropriated, you know, regardless of its dollar value, you know, because you could do 180,000. I don't particularly agree with, you know, putting a cloud track in appropriations, but, you wanted to. but maybe that's a, that's a bullet that we add so that it's covered so people understand here are the three funding sources appropriations, long term debt, and short term debt. You can do any three. I think it's also um, there's grants, there's reserves, there's and I think we we certainly this year talking to the bond agent, talking about our debt policy and and how we manage our debt load, how we take it on, and when we wait for some to retire before we add new to it or something like that. I think that's an important piece as well. To your point, Peter, of you know people want to know you know how it impacts our future debt load. Well, if we're retiring x amount of debt sure. we've got a decision to make do we want to take on more debt to offset that because we got good rates or do we want to retire that debt completely and lower our overall debt i mean i think that's that's a, an ongoing discussion that we have for for bonding and things like that on a regular basis so i i think you know again it's it, it's communication for sure and those are areas we need to improve on we, we all all acknowledge that i i just um you know, I, I, I could I could support the the the, the, the policy. Um, nothing set in stone. We could run it through, and and if we had challenges this year trying to determine what goes in and what mm -hmm. goes out and why, um, would staff recommend tweaking it and trying it again, or would you s suggest just going with what we have? And I guess my experience is I don't think we'll ever be able to come up with a perfect. fail-safe, perfect. Right. It is or it isn't. Right. There's going to be this. There has to be some flexibility in it. Uh, and I, I think there is. Uh, to Peter's point um, regarding, you know, where things are going to be down the road, where we well, we show us the one year, mm -hmm. essentially, not the future. We do get estimated uh, bond schedules for for yep. these projects, mm -hmm. so you know it's mostly a staffing issue. But we could say, here's where we are now with our debt service. Here's what we expect to see retired and. Mm. Assumed new based on at least this year, not further out. But uh. but, to, but to Peter's point, I think that it needs to be. Um, so the, by the way, those bond schedules are pretty complicated to read sometimes. 
I really think that even on the, on the um, summary page for this capital, on the long and short term debt, even, all you really need to take is what is that current debt that you're adding? What is the amortization over the next five years? If it's short term debt, it's less than five. What is the annual payment for that particular, for that group of projects for the next five years? Mm. You know, year one, two, three, right. kind of like that. Yeah. And then do the same thing for the long term debt. And then, for the, then do a, a summary of all the debt. In just that year, you don't need to compare it. You don't need to add what's being retired and what's not. It's, they're looking at what is the impact of that particular. Question. Another some more simplified approach is to calculate the estimated cost of financing. Yep. You know, uh, a lot of decisions have to be made. How long are we going to finance it for? What's the expected rate? Uh, there'll be assumptions that need to be made in that analysis. But so what I would um, so if there's no. Um, so um, what I would suggest, if we are moving forward, and it sounds like we are moving forward with this, I would like to recommend that we add an additional on page three that underneath um, determine the funding source for a project being improved. Um, the next two bullets should actually be indented because it's a subset. And that the first bullet um, right before the long term, or maybe the last, it's up to you, is that we make some type of comment around appropriations that funding can be appropriated in the current tax year or the current budget cycle um, of any dollar amount, regardless of the value. Could we do that with all the other ones too, the property taxes, the grants, the reserves? I don't think you need to get into specifics because you're talking about any projects that are going to be funded in the budget. A grant is funded in the budget. So I don't think you need to break it down between the, the subcategories because we're looking at a, a higher level. Okay. I mean, I'm okay with that if you guys are. Okay. I'll put them together and circulate it just for your I mean, blessing. Did you want us to put something in there about the different types of funding mechanisms or that should be covered right there? Okay. I don't. No, I mean, again, I think it's, you know, I mean, it's kind of incumbent upon us to, to figure out as a committee yeah. what we're supposed to be doing and how we're going to manage that. Um, you know, that's part that should be part of our regular discussion on debt service and everything. And that conversation starts with my proposed budget, among other right. things. Right. I'll recommend a funding source that's right. part of your review yeah. to consider that and change it if you don't like it. So um, with that, um, I just want to make sure, is back to page two, is everyone comfortable on page two not to, uh, based on the prior work, uh, the with estimate cost in excess for both of those two definitions to simply eliminate that? Mm -hmm. So that's a friend, just to take them out. The other observation you made is the word major in both those definitions, yep. whether that we could live without that word or is that it's left to interpretation of? It depends on what the definition of the word is. is <laughs> well, to me, if you're going to, uh, to me, major is supported by the bullets that are on page three, which is the 100,000. Because you're not going to sit there and put a different value in that red line than the hundred thousand that's in the two bullets. So they're going to be exactly the same. So whether you know, so whether we include the word major or not, the two bullets are defining what our definitions really are. Good. I will make these changes. We can send it for a quick little review and approval from you. Uh, do you expect it to come back to this committee for approval, or do you want me to advance so it to I council? Mm -hmm. What's your preference? No, I think if he circulates it. As long as we're okay. All right. We give our okay. It'll be then. September council yes. at this point. So okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Good. Um, so with those uh, changes and with the uh, work to be, um, I do want to at least um, for the record just to uh, entertain a motion to approve the capital planning policy. Um, so by the way, Tom, did we, I thought we changed that. Wasn't it capital planning and budgeting? No. Well, we have a. We can add that. I, um, I didn't capture that. Maybe that was. Why don't we call it CIP like it is? Right? Capital investment improvement. Yeah, I mean that's what we're addressing. I know. CIP budget, right? Yeah. Yeah, Sorry we can for add bringing it up. Budgeting, if you like it. No, 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 no. Um, uh, you know what? Never mind my question. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Sometimes you ask a question and you know, it question. So I would ask for a motion to approve the capital planning policy as amended. Um, and that we move it to the September Council meeting. Motion. Motion moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Great. That's three to zero. Thank you. That was easy. Yeah. So um, I forgot. I just want to mention I do have a hard stop for myself. And, um, if you would like to continue without me, but I have to be out of here by about 5.50, 5.55 for an appointment. So I'm, 
there's a, a lot of conversation ahead too. Um, fund balance policy is our next item. Um, I had presented, uh, so a couple of things. I had presented at least a, a starting draft, very rough starting draft. I don't know, is it in here? I don't, I don't recall. Oh, here's the old. That's the existing. Thing. That's the existing. I had actually. Is this yours? Nope. No? I, I apologize. I forgot to bring it. Um, I had at least sent around a, a starting point rough draft. Um, I will make sure that you get a copy of it again. So the, the, t the observation, just to get started, um, is that I took what I will call an editor's pen to the current policy solely out of consistency and out of intent. What that means is that the current title is fund balance policy, but yet it only addresses unrestricted funds. Hmm. So fund balance policy needs to really kind of um, look at all funds, regardless of its source um, or its use. So um, I had actually uh, taken a look at that. So I had drafted some changes based on that. The second is a more analytical or I'd say a, a substantive change or recommendation, which is in section two. Um, I was recommending a change to the current level of the unrestricted fund balance to be um, evaluated. Uh, it's currently at 8.3% or one twelfth of Scarborough's operating budget and not to fall below five, just the historically, which I love bringing up. When I first started on this council, I actually help draft this, um, the fund balance was less than 3%. Really? Wow. And that was probably in 2002, 2003, and we were constantly at zero because of the way that uh, the council managed its money. Um, but it was a very different time. 20 years ago, it was a very different town. So the question is, is that where are we today and, and where do we want to be? So that's something to consider. Um, again, I will be happy to send around at least that draft. The, the piece that isn't included in my draft is um, anything related to the other categories uh, outside of unrestricted fund balance. So it's our gas fee requirements. Yeah, so, um, and for us it's not really, um, it's more about how do we monitor those balances and then what are they used for and from year to year, how are those accounts kind of managed, so. I do have uh, an elected official's guide to fund balance that incorporates, you know, explains some of these things. That would be can awesome. Pass them up to you if you'd like. Mm -hmm. and Sean, you uh, you started to say, but I didn't hear you say. Are you, do you have a percentage in mind that you'd like that to be? Well, it's a baseline to have the conversation start. I just want that to be clear. It's only for conversational purposes. <laughs> we got it. And this is based upon. The we'll, we'll reflect. Uh, I want that caveat. <laughs> I'm not wearing any protective gear, <laughs> um, but it's based. I know it's based upon the conversation that the auditors gave us. If you recall, regarding our balance, um, I actually was going to recommend that the unrestricted fund um, equal to 10% of Scarborough's operating budget and not to fall below 8.3%. Um, there are some additional adjustments where. If it um, grows greater than 12%, then um, there are options. And actually, I was also looking at um, expanding the options. The current budget says that we can only use it for capital funds. One of the things that I think that we need to look at because of the source of some of that uh, fund balance that's coming in is um, looking at, if possible, uh, restricted accounts that can, the funds can then later be used to either ease education um, what are, you know, rate stabilization, there's different terminologies that unfunded can be used. Unfunded liabilities. Unfunded liability accounts. Yeah. But there's allocations that can happen. It just isn't going to be just capital funds. Keep in mind when that was created, um, I think it, um, I mean, to go above 8.3 or 10 percent, um, you know, a $500,000 contribution to capital funds was pretty significant. Today's projects, that doesn't even pay for a third of some of the road projects that we have, mm -hmm. you know, to offset okay. it. So. It's a starting point for conversation. I'm not married to it. I just wanted to at least have a conversation because we're in a nice financial position to do right. so. What was your max, 12? The 12 percent, yeah. So in line in section three, any excess above 12 percent will be assigned for and then expand. It's not just capital needs. So you'll circulate that? I will circulate that document. And then, so the goal is that we start the conversation. Um, I know that the Rules and Policy Committee is also um, interested in this. So outside of Peter and I who are on rules and policy, there's also Will Rowan is, is uh, interested. So we might uh, seek his at least uh, opinion, not necessarily forward it to rules and policy, but seek his opinion before it goes to mm -hmm. the council just to involve him since yeah. 
they had an interest, but we will be drafting the recommendation. Yeah, would this lie? Why would this lie in rules and policy? Because the fund balance policy is a, a policy of that rules and policy overseas. But capital, the capital planning one wouldn't be? Um, it will be, be. Yeah, I know. I know. Everybody wants to. Every, hey, you know when you're the cool when you're the cool kids. You know everybody wants to be part of the discussion. Um, hello, and um, so anyway, so um, but that was started before Will was even elected. So that's kind of you know we'll give him that credit. Anyways, I'm trying to be nice to everybody. Of course, this policy change, if there is one, will go to the full council, so Absolutely. they'll all be in weigh in. Just a just a parting thought. My experience working with financial advisors and more importantly with the financial analysts with Moody's and with Standard Four, we are probably at the low end of what they'd like to see. But most importantly, if we have a policy, we've got to stick to it. So we could set 20 percent, but if it's unattainable, it will be worse than yes. if if we uh, consistently perform well at 8.3. Yeah. So that's just a you know. If I recall, away. actually, um, the analyst talked about that the kind of going rate is 15 percent is, is is the new norm or the new expectation. And there are some as high over 20 yeah. percent, which seems to me that's a little high. We also did the evaluation of if we that's met that, what would that do to our our, right. our bond performance or our bond rating, and it would impact it not. It, it didn't seem to significantly impact. It wouldn't improve it. That, that strikes me as you're keeping too much of the people's money. Right. You don't need yes. that to operate yeah. the town. Uh, right. But wasn't there? Wasn't there? There was. We did get a benefit by being there. There's a sweet zone where there was some difference in the bond rates over the 8.3, and I think it was 10ish or 10.2 or something. Was yeah, that? Yeah. Well, there was a tick. I remember seeing an it, uptick, it, but it, it was, was a small yeah, it was 50 it was basis well, points. Yeah. Uh, something like the that. Analyst yeah. The analyst comments in the in the uh, bond rating actually focused on the fact that we fell below 8.3% in 2010, but we committed, when we did our bond presentation, we committed to getting it back up, and we did it. Right. And because we committed to it and did it, that's where we got the tick. It was because of our performance. And yeah. it did say that because of that increase, it, uh, um, we saved between seventeen and $25,000 right. on, on, yeah. on that bond issue. So. But you're right. There's a point at which there's diminishing returns. Diminishing returns, right? But there, there's got to be a sweet spot where it maximizes. Yeah, so it would be nice to know what that. Provided. What that. I'll, I'll dig, uh, dig out his presentation or yeah. talk to him sure. and see if we can find what that is. So with that, if there's no objection, we'll move that to the next uh, yeah. next meeting, and I'll send out what I have. We'll table it. And then um, this is really more of an overview. Um, so we won't, we're nowhere to have a thorough conversation now. But we were asked last year by the executive committee, uh, sorry, by the uh, town council, um, we being the finance committee, to begin a compensation analysis of the town manager's compensation. I um, want to make sure it is extremely clear this is not a result of any performance issue. This is, this is a knowledge-based decision where we can get up to speed about where we are in comparison to our peer groups. Um, you know, how do we manage compensation so that um, we have a standard policy or at least a standard analysis going forward. Um, it does coincide, coincidentally, with the manager's um, next contract negotiation, which is in 2017. So we thought that uh, we could get started now um, and at least begin the data collection from, I know MMA has a very thorough survey of, um, of data and um, asked the town manager if we could be allocated um, the human resource manager to be kind of our liaison for any uh, mm -hmm. expertise um, in that because there will be some times that we need to have an HR specialist. Um, I think that I want to share at least the ones that I've talked to on the council. This is the first step with what I think a lot of people are hoping will become a more comprehensive look at compensation throughout the community. Primarily, um, it is solely on our municipal side. It is not, um, we're not evaluating educational um, salary, pensions, and things like that, but it's on the municipal side, which includes contracted labor or, or bargaining units. So this is a, our beginning step to kind of put the fundamentals in place um, and have the accepted norms and the accepted uh, things that we want so that we can build on that going forward and become better stewards um, for our employees as well. So um, this, is, this was just to put it on the agenda so that we can get started, uh, so the public was aware of what we were doing. Um, any comments from you guys on that? So uh, next step for us is to um, what start I, doing some homework? Or? Yeah, I will, so what I was thinking of doing, if it's okay, is that I, I was going to sit down and kind of um, draft an outline for us to kind of look at with Tom's uh, assistance as far as, uh, um, I've already done a little bit of research, um, but uh, really what is our next step, you know, and it's, it's the higher level project management pieces, you know, 
data collection, meetings, um, analysis, things like that, and then conversations around that. So I'll have for the next meeting at least an outline of how we can begin this project. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can build on that outline and then begin the actual work probably in October. Okay. Is my kind of thinking through that, if that's okay yeah. with you yeah. two? Yeah. I'm glad you're getting started. I mean, yeah. The current contract runs through December of 17, so there's, there's some time, but yeah. that time up on but your I mean, history. and not to delve. To, I mean, we need to. The council, I believe, needs to make a decision about that contract 90 days before December. So, six, as a council, we really need six months before. I six think. months. Sorry, yeah. six months. So, you know, it's December. It's really much, much earlier. So, we need to get started now. Good. Good. I know. Huh? So, with that, um, future meeting and dates. Um, the last time. Um, we talked, I have a, uh, we normally would meet at 4 o'clock. I was able to this week, um, just as a coincidence, but I cannot meet before 5.30, 6 o'clock because of new uh, employment requirements. Um, I'm actually working out of the area, and it's about a 45-minute commute back here, so it's just almost impossible. Um, so the question I have is, do we want to keep the same schedule at 6 p.m.? With our apologies to staff, because we know that it gets into your time. Except for Colette. We'll, we'll excuse Colette. <laughs> <laughs> she just gave me the evil eye. I thought my wife was in the back row there for a second. <laughs> uh, I, I, I find Wednesdays, I prefer to keep it on Wednesdays if okay. you can. Yeah, um, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, it's going to 6 p.m. It's either the off. second or fourth. Right. Um, yeah. Off council hours. So starting in September, um, do we want to go back to the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month? Sure. At 6 p.m.? Two meetings a month? Um, yeah, to start because that way we can get the com the compensation and the fund balance is going to. My goal is that I would really like to see the fund balance. Personal goal, unless these guys tell me no, is to have the fund balance um, have a new fund balance policy before the council. With you know October, it's something we've been working on too, you know for a while. So um, that's going to take a little bit of time and conversation, and then the town manager's compensation might have to be its own meeting just by itself, depending on how much data and what we get. So. I don't have the calendar, the 2nd and 4th, some of those dates. The 2nd is uh, September 14th, and the 4th is September 28th. So, All right, subject to us uh, getting space. Yep. So um, the, the real boss in the back row is uh, waving a finger at us, politely waving. Just a reminder that I will have difficulty getting space on the 2nd Wednesday of the month. I go to the Zoning Board. Oh, that's right. They've had a long-standing. Yep, I don't want to interfere meeting. with the ZBA. Can you meet over there, or do they need the whole space? Depending on the hearings, they may need all all the space. So, um, how how does Tuesday? Uh, no, Tuesday does not work for me. I have Eagles. Thursday? No, because uh, Wednesday or Friday. Let's see. I know what we want to do on Friday at six o'clock. Why don't we wait and see what we? Can do? Yeah, let's see what we could do. If we have to, we can have it in the town manager's conference room. We just have a video camera. Yep. So uh, with that, because we do have it, two citizens here, uh, we have public comment. Um, Mr. Turk, would you like to speak, or Ms. Uh, Holbrook, Mrs. Holbrook? <laughs> welcome, by the way, former <laughs> Councilor Holbrook. I'm hiding in the background. Um, You're welcome to, uh, to speak if you'd like, Mr. Turk. Anything? No, okay, thank you. Um, any final comments from members? Uh, no, it's been a great summer. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get through uh, August. Great. Anything else? <laughs> No? Uh, move to adjourn. Second. Uh, All in favor? Great. Thank you.